Welcome to the Center for Critical Leadership webinar. Here's your host, Judy Emlin. Hi, everyone. It's so great to see you. We're in the midst of summer here in uh, North America, and it is hot, and there are thunderstorms and all kinds of things going on. But I'm so delighted that uh, this core group has uh, elected to come and spend an hour with us, and many, many others will be tuning in on the recorded event, so welcome to you also. I first heard about Doug Conant when uh, the very, very famous story of his writing 30,000 handwritten letters of appreciation to these people while at the Campbell Soup Company just really impressed me. I mean, 30,000. Listen to that number. I can't even say it without going, oh, how did he do that? But uh, IIL was delighted to have uh, Doug on our Leadership and Innovation Conference. And I cornered him there. And I said, how did you, when he was taping his uh, uh, piece, I said, how did you ever manage to write 30,000 letters of appreciation? And it's really not so much the number, but the intent that made me realize that Doug was a kindred spirit. And I just had to have him as a guest on the Center for Grateful Leadership. So Doug, you've done many things in your life. I know you're the founder and the CEO of Conant Leadership, and you've written a, a beautiful book, which uh, I, I have my own autographed copy of. And you, you, this is that was just the beginning. So tell us about you, about how you actually brought forth your own natural uh, inclinations to appreciate people, to be grateful to them, just to notice them. So Thank you, Judy. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here with everybody uh, today. And uh, it's been a fun journey as I've uh, I'm finally doing what my mother told me I should do, is write thank you notes after every holiday to all my relatives. I never got it then. And then years later, I was giving a speech, and she was in the audience. And I was talking about the importance of writing thank you notes. And, and, uh, and, and she stood up in this room and took all the credit. At that point, she was about 88. And, uh, and, and she was a proud mother. She, just was, she chastised me because it took me a long time to get the message. But that was my mother. Uh, no, it's a it's a thrill to be here with everybody today. You know, uh, I've had a long corporate career working for four amazing companies: General Mills, Kraft, where I was director of strategy; Nabisco, ultimately where I was president of Nabisco Foods, and was employed there for the decade that KKR owned them as part of Barbarians at the Gate. Then went on to another decade of service as CEO of Campbell Soup Company, and then went on to chairman to be chairman of Avon uh, Products in New York. Uh, but all along the way, uh, I it became increasingly apparent to me that uh, uh, that I wasn't doing much. Everybody around me was doing all the work. And I needed to celebrate that work with them uh, to, to help give them the energy to do the things they needed to do in service to our organization. Uh, before I kind of go into that, could we go to the first slide, Roxy, uh, the, uh, the quote slide? I think it might be the second, I don't know, it might be the second slide. I, Roxy's my, uh, my wingman here, my wing woman. Uh, I, I, I love this quote by Alice Walker. Alice Walker, you may know, is the author of The Color Purple. And she's an amazing poet, writer, social commentator. And she has a daughter uh, now who is picking up that uh, mantle. But you know, she says, thank you is the best prayer that anyone could say. And then she says, I say that one a lot. Thank you expresses gratitude, humility, understanding. And I read this quite a while ago, but the notion of what thank you expresses, thank you is the best prayer that anyone could say. And when I think about a prayer, 
I think about a, a, what I would call a solemn expression of thanks, a genuine expression of thanks. When I think about gratitude, extreme gratitude, I think a readiness to show appreciation, quality of being, th just the quality of being thankful. I think about humility, and to me, it's thinking about others before oneself. So when I'm saying thank you, I'm thinking about their service before my service. And when and the concept of understanding was interesting to me. I didn't really get that when I first read the quote. But I've come to believe that when she talks about extreme gratitude, humility, understanding, she's talking about, in, in the word understanding, she's talking about comprehension. And that you're consciously understanding the world around you and you're alert to these other people who are serving selflessly to move things forward. So I find thinking of thank you as, a, as the best prayer anyone could say uh, struck home with me. And on that note, I'll just move to the next slide, and then we can lose the slides until the end when we run that brief video. I'd like to share with you my thank you story. Uh, and uh, God, I was a good-looking guy back in the day. You know, look at that. Suspenders, tie. I, I was hot. Uh, but we can lose the slide now, Roxy, and I'll uh, just talk. Um, but uh, growing up, as I said, my mother was always encouraging me to write my thank you notes. And I was a typical son who wasn't going to do what his mother told him to do. So I never did. But way down in my career, I, I graduated from college and graduate school. I went to work. And nine years into my career, I was uh, had a very difficult incident where I was fired from a job. And uh, you know, I walked in one day, and the fellow said, "Doug, your position's been eliminated. You need to be out of here by noon." And nine years of my career was over in a snap. And I had to quickly reinvent myself. They connected me with an outplacement fellow by the name of Neil McKenna. And Neil got to know me pretty well. And he, uh, he was a real straight shooting New Englander. And he said, Doug, you're going to be a terrible interview. And I said, why? He said, well, you don't tell anybody anything. You know, uh, it's hard to believe today. But I was shy, reserved. I was raised to not speak unless spoken to. I was brought up to answer the question and, uh, and, and do it briefly. And I, it was sort of the way I had developed myself. And uh, I was felt horribly uncomfortable going out for interviews. He said, you're going to need to find a signature practice that works for you, that helps you connect with the world that you're trying to get into. And uh, I did my best. I, I was still a lousy interview. But uh, I, I came upon a practice. I said, you know, uh, I'm going to start writing thank you notes to people. My mother's right. Uh, and uh, so I would go to a building. I would meet the receptionist. And he or she would send me to HR. And then I'd go tour around the building, do interviews with assistants and, and uh, managers. I would get the name of everybody I met that day. Uh, and I would write it down. I would, as I left the building, I would go next door to the coffee shop. And I would hand write a note to each person who helped me, including the receptionist at the front of the building. After I had handwritten all the notes, I would walk them over to the building and ask that they be delivered that same day. Uh, now, first of all, the receptionist had never gotten a note before in his or her life. Nobody ever thanks a receptionist at the front of a building for letting them in. But you know what? The next time I went back to that building, that person knew me and was there to help me and said, oh, it's great to have you back. I so appreciated that note you gave me. I never got a note like that. And, and then as I started conducting my search and meeting all these people, I found they were inclined to help me. And all I needed to do was express a little gratitude, humility, and understanding, just like Alice Walker suggests. And they would work with me. And it gave them a good feeling to know that they were being helpful and that someone was appreciating them. And I was astounded at how that facilitated my entry back into the work world. 
despite being a lousy interview. So fast forward, I get to I went to work at Kraft for seven years, and I continued note writing, but not in an extreme sense. And then I got to KKR, Barbarians at the Gate, and it was the Wild West. And I worked there for 10 years, ultimately the last five years as president of Nabisco Foods. And people were under a lot of pressure. And uh, some of the pressure I created, we had to perform. But you know, a lot of people were doing good work. And I found that it was helpful if I could celebrate that good work. So I did a number of things to celebrate uh, their work, and one of them was writing handwritten notes, just like I had when I was on my job search. And that led to a habit that I developed when I went to Campbell as CEO. We were a very troubled company. We had the lowest employee engagement scores in all of the Fortune 500. And by the way, 300 Fortune 500 companies had actually been through the employee engagement process, and Gallup had their numbers. So we, we were in the midst of a terrible situation. We were headquartered in the poorest, most dangerous city in the United States, Camden, New Jersey. 75,000 people, 70 murders a year. It was a very, very challenging environment. And it was clear to me something that I've always believed. You can't win in the marketplace unless you first win in the workplace. And so we had to create a sense of community in the workplace that was, that was uh, sufficient to give people the energy to do the work. So I started writing notes. I wrote 10 to 20 notes a day. I had a two-hour commute to and from work, so I was in the car four hours a day. I had somebody driving me. On the way home, I would read about everything that had happened in the company that day. On the way into work, I would write 10 to 20 notes. And uh, I did that uh, from the get-go. When I retired, someone from Forbes or Fortune was interviewing me, and they said, uh, we hear you write a lot of thank you notes. Do you know how many you've written? And I have, we never kept track. But I knew I did 10 to 20 a day, and oftentimes well over that. I knew 10, to, 10 notes a day. If you just multiplied it out over the decade I was there, that was 30,000 notes, as Judy mentioned. The interesting thing is we only had 20,000 employees. So wherever you went in the world, we were in 38 countries. We were marketed in 125 countries. Inside of a cubicle somewhere, you would see this handwritten note from me posted uh, saying, thank you for doing this good thing for our company. Important thing about thank you notes in the work context was I wasn't just wishing them happy birthday. That would be nice. And I did a few of those. But most of them were, thank you for delivering this project on time under budget. Or thank you for facilitating this Women of Campbell meeting. Or things that mattered and were part of the strategic agenda of the company. So in a way, I was saying thank you. But in another way, I was being clear about what mattered. And I was supporting them in a way that was most compelling. Can you still hear me? I have lost you. Yes, I can hear you, Doug. Hello? Can you hear me? I can't see anything, but that's OK. Uh, I will keep going. So the, the, the notion here is using thank you notes to sincerely appreciate others for good work and also being clear about what the standards are of your company. So from that point, I, uh, I started, I did that for the whole decade I was there. Another thing that happened, I started to work on a, uh, my assistant in the 2008 meltdown said, Doug, you've got to get out of your office more. People need to hear what's going on. I said, I don't want to go out of my office. It, you know, it, it, this was when uh, all the CEOs were keeping their heads down because the economy was uh, tanking so badly and nobody wanted to talk to anybody. And she said, no, no you've got to get out there. I said, I'm not going. The next day, she put an article in our portal saying, Doug's going to start walking around the building every day. I said, why did you do that? She said, because you need to get out there. 
uh, I said, oh, I'm not going. The next day, she brought in a pedometer, and she had uh, the driver bring my walking shoes into the building. She said, starting tomorrow, you're going to start walking. I said, I don't have time. She said, I'll make time. An hour, I'll find an hour every day. There's an hour where you can get up and walk around. We just never know when it will be, but I'll get it. And you go out there and you talk to people. They need to hear from you. So, uh, and I'll make sure they know that if you're walking around and thanking them or talking to them, you may not be able to stop because you've got your shoes on and your pedometer on and you're trying to get your 10,000 steps in for the day. So I'll give you a little air cover, but you're going out there. I said, I'm not going. The next day, she had me out walking around the building, and it was the best thing that ever happened. I basically was channeling my inner Tom Peters from 40 years ago, 50 years ago, in search of excellence, and I was managing by wandering around. So I was not only delivering thank you notes that I could thoughtfully craft without people, I was starting to actually connect with people and say thank you in person. Those two practices enabled me to forge a special connection with the company. I guess the last thing I'll say, and then we're going to run a brief video, uh, is that uh, this, this notion of saying thank you, in my opinion, was foundational to all that we did at Campbell. We lifted Campbell up from being the lowest employee engagement in the Fortune 500 to being the highest employee engagement in the Fortune 500. On an engagement ratio basis from Gallup, we went from 2 to 1, 2 engaged for every 1 disengaged, to 23 to 1, which was the highest they'd ever tracked. And my top 350 leaders went from 2 to 1 to 77 to 1, which Gallup had never seen before in a population that large. And a lot of it had to do with me appreciating their work as they did the heavy lifting that served our shareholders, our customers, and our communities. So listen, uh, thank you. Saying thank you is about the most powerful uh, tool in the toolkit. I highly recommend it. When I retired, my, uh, the employees did a video of me. And I'm going to show you a four-minute clip, and then I'll be done and we can talk. Uh, uh, they did a almost 10-minute clip, which is on my website at conantleadership.com. I'm going to show you four minutes of it, thanking me for thanking them. It was such a, uh, it was so integral to the way we led Campbell to a place uh, most people thought would be impossible. So with that, Roxy, I'm going to ask you to uh, roll that video for our friends, and then we can talk. so that it doesn't keep pausing like that. Thanks for all your help. You are making a big difference. Eric, thank you for helping out. I think of you at every extraordinary performance award ceremony. Thanks for modeling this nourishing people's lives behavior. It is one of the many things that makes our company so special. Thank you for joining us for lunch today on short notice. I hope you found the discussion helpful. Have a great year, Doug. Thank you for helping out and thank you for the holiday card. Cheers. Lorraine, sounds like a great meeting. When you have a chance, please get 15 minutes on my show schedule and take me through your Women of Campbell Global Plan. Thanks, Doug. We started at Campbell Soup back in 2004, and over the years I've received several personal notes from Doug uh, for the work that either I've done or our group has done, uh, and it always has a great impact. After my first interview with Campbell, There was a book uh, that Doug shared 
uh, with me about uh, Campbell's and the history of Campbell's. And then it was a, a very, very personal note that uh, I, I read to my family. And uh, the following Monday, I accepted the offer with Campbell's. And uh, for that, I'm forever grateful. I've had the opportunity to know Doug for many years through my involvement in siphoning college and his involvement in SIFE. From the note I received on my first day here at Campbell's, to thank you notes that I've gotten from participating in lunches with him, to his daily check-in. He's in our department when he walks through in his effort to get 10,000 steps in a day. One thing I know for sure is that everybody will really miss Doug and seeing him walk through our office. A group of us had this idea about a mural painted by employees, but we couldn't get any traction on the idea until one day, as I was walking down the hallway, I ran into Doug. He liked the idea and he supported it. And he helped bring it to life. One of my favorite memories Doug was the time when I was reading to a group of students and it was a program called Read and Believe and we had read to the children and we walked outside to wait for their bus to come. Their bus never came, never came and they were outside for like 15 minutes rowdy running around screaming and I was trying to calm them all down. Doug had walked up and saw the kids, and he sat down on the bench and he took the book and just started reading to these kids. And they started climbing all over him and really seriously listening to him. Everybody already knows that. Um, that and he was really enjoying it, and so were they. It was just a really sweet. moment. My dad works at the Campbell's Napoleon plant, and when I was 10 years old, I won the Napoleon Campbell's Soup 50th Anniversary Essay Contest. It was just a real... Well, that's my story. That's, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. So uh, uh, I can tell you, the more you put out into the universe, the more that comes back to you. Judy knows that. And... Uh, uh, I, I'm grateful to have the opportunity to share a little bit of the story with you. It, it runs wide and deep in my life, but to give you a little snapshot picture of it, uh, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, and we're open for business. So anybody wants, has questions or comments, uh, bring it on. I am not hearing Judy. Taking the oh, okay. time. Okay. Uh, now I do. Can you hear me yes. Now? Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. I, I, uh, I wanted to say, or I did try to say, that we thank you so much for sharing yourself and your time and your message with us today. It really is so profoundly inspiring. And doesn't it make everyone wonder why aren't all leaders like this? I mean, yes, it took a little pushing uh, uh, from your mother and a few of your co-workers, but, but you took their coaching, and look at the huge impact it had. So that's uh, my initial reaction. Why can't all leaders be like that? Tell us, Doug. Well, I, uh, well, you know, uh, Leadership work is hard. It's hard work, Judy. You know that. And uh, leaders get caught up in the thick of thin things and trying to deliver on a lot of fronts. And uh, uh, many of the leaders I know who struggle with this are always worried about the next thing. So they don't really stop and celebrate what's been done. And uh, 
in all my coaching, I, I strongly, I, I strongly urge them to celebrate what's being done uh, before they move on to the next thing. And it sets the table so much more effectively uh, than otherwise, and it's something that anybody can, is capable of doing. So, uh, uh, but I agree with you. It 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 needs to be a practice that's employed by all, and sadly, it's not. Well, thank you for being uh, a wonderful role model for us. Okay, what uh, I, I noticed some wonderful comments uh, about your presentation in the text chat. Maybe a few of you would like to share it and ask Doug a question. Harry Waldron says, "This is your one shot at me." World government, society, etc. Can you hear me, Dougie? Can you hear? Yeah, me? I I I hear you in and out, but I hear I hear you. Okay, yeah. Harry Waldron technically wrote in the in the chat, "What our business, world, government, society, etc. all need is more grateful, gr uh, grateful and acknowledgement, gratitude and acknowledgement. They are powerful motivational tools to uplift others, and that that's our message here. That's why we." been in existence with this message now for four years yeah. and before that with uh, you know books on the subject but uh, it, it's, it's well it's I, I you know Judy I agree with that but it's more than just the gratitude it uh, when you when you express gratitude you are setting standards for performance you are telling people what's working, what level of performance they need to be at, and uh, what level of effort they need to give. Uh, you're encouraging them. Uh, so I see the notion of grateful leadership as not just expressing gratitude and thanks, and uh, but also it's as setting standards. Like this is what we this is what we expect, and you know, most of our organizations are built, most large organizations, and I work with the government, I work with nonprofits, I work with universities, and I work with the corporate sector. We're all built to be critical thinking machines. We find what's wrong and we fix it. And that becomes the maniacal focus of the enterprise more often than we care to admit. Meanwhile, even in the most broken of enterprises, eight out of ten things being done is being done right. But the entire energy of the organization is focused on fixing the two things that are being done wrong. And uh, I think to be an effective leader today, you need to be spending half your time celebrating what's working and telling people what's working and letting them know that that's appreciated as opposed to spending all of your time working on what's not working. And uh, I can't, I'm astounded across all sectors at how leaders fall prey to this, this approach of focusing on what's wrong as opposed to focusing on what's right. Absolutely. OK, any other questions or comments? My, my question is, um, as someone with such an important role, how did you find the time to um, write all those notes all the time? Hey, let me tell you. Stephen Covey, uh, who became a very good friend of mine, in fact, his son wrote the foreword to the book that Judy held up. Uh, uh, he, he, he was always preaching to me, Doug, what matters most must never be at the mercy of what matters least. And I believe you have to win in the workplace before you can win in the marketplace. And I believe if you're going to win in the workplace, you have to celebrate what's working as well as deal with what's not working. To me, this was strategically important as well as important from a human perspective. Uh, and so I made time for it. I made time for it wherever I went. When I was on my job search, I'd go next door to the coffee shop. Uh, when I was traveling, I would always cut out time to write these notes every day. Uh, I, you know, I, you don't have to do ten a day, uh, but if you just did one a day, 
and you and you were vigilant and you looked for somebody who did something right and you celebrated it with them, you've made progress. Uh, I, I just think you have to figure out, you've got to make it a priority and then you have to do it. I had as crazy a life as anybody could have in my day. They're not, not as crazy it is, as it is today, I, I admit it, you know. But, uh, you, you know, I just think it's that important. You have to make time for it. Uh, and, it, you know, I got a kick. I, years ago, I, uh, Mark uh, Zuckerberg was talking about the new habit he does. He has a new habit every year that he works on at Facebook. And one year he was saying, uh, I'm going to write a thank you, one thank you note a week. And somehow I was quoted because I at that point had become known for writing thank you notes as, as I was quoted as saying, one a week? You know, there's so much good stuff going on at Facebook. You, there's got to be more than one a week. But I wasn't doing it in a negative way. I was saying there was just a lot of opportunity there, but somehow it got misread. Let me tell you, if you do one a week, you are changing the life of that one person. And, and you're putting a spring in their step that will add value to the enterprise guaranteed. So, you know, you've, you've got to find the right balance, but I believe you just have to make it a priority. And uh, that's easy to say, but I, I can also tell you that if I could find time to do it, uh, you can. When I was at Campbell, I had four hours in the car, but I had lots of other things I could have been doing. But it was a priority, and I did it. And you can, too, in a way that works for you. It has to fit into your cockamamie life, for sure. <laughs> OK, now, uh, one of our participants, Jonathan McCoy, said, Doug, was how the turnaround and employee engagement at Campbell Soup reflected in the bottom line of profitability? In the balance sheet? Ooh, that's a great question. Uh, absolutely. Uh, it is a great question. We had lost half our market value in the year prior to me being recruited there. And, uh, you know, part of uh, one's success is having a low base. But um, we, uh, we navigated out of that and had a great 10-year run. Uh, where we created, uh, uh, we were in the top tier of the global food companies in terms of uh, return on invested capital, cash flow, and earnings per share growth uh, for a decade. And we were a canned soup company basically making the same product we had made 100 years earlier. So uh, we, uh, we, we kicked it up. A big part of our turnaround was around innovative practices for building culture and delivering new products. And I think gratitude paid a large role in that as well. So, uh, and you better believe that people who were turning in better numbers were also getting notes from me saying, good job, keep it coming. Uh, we celebrated the, the earnings and the return growth as well as the, uh, as well as the contributions in terms of culture building. I, I do think, you know, as a leader, my, my line is that we have to be tough-minded on standards and tender-hearted with people. I grew up in, in a world where leaders were supposed to be tough, and uh, that was the expectation. And I was never quite comfortable with that. I did see the need to have high standards, but I, did, I, I thought one could also care at the same time. And... Uh, uh, so we had high standards on financial performance. We didn't cut corners there. Uh, and I found that celebrating contributions of significance financially uh, led to better performance financially over time. I would also say that I was not, I'm not part of the quick fix generation. I believe that uh, it's, in our company's case, it was a continuous improvement model where we didn't try and shoot the lights out overnight. We, we wanted to do a little bit better tomorrow than we did today. Uh, we were in a slow growth industry, uh, retail food. Uh, if you grew 2 to 3% on the top line, if you grew with population, which was 2%, and then you got a little out of price or a little out of mix, you got it up 3 or 4%, 
with your assets depreciated, you could get good earnings and good cash flow out of that model, and you could grow in a nice, steady, predictable way uh, that that was a win for employees, a win for customers, a win for consumers, and a win for shareholders. And so we had a model that that promised continued growth. I did it for 10 years. My successor did it for another five and had a great run. And then she got, then her team got a little more aggressive on acquisitions and they stubbed their toes and they took a step back. But now they're going in the right direction again. But we had a good 15 year run uh, between myself and my successor, uh, which uh, stood up to scrutiny anywhere in the global food group. Well, Doug, this is great, and I, I wish we had more time to just keep going on and on because we've gotten some great comments. And uh, Roxy, if you could, um, you know, uh, send the comments to Doug, maybe he can follow yeah. up uh, with responses to those people. Yeah. Uh, but th Doug, this was great. Okay. Please uh, stay connected. Your message is a very powerful one for all of us. A very. Uh, inspirational and easy, which is a great combination. So thank you so much for being here today. And you're welcome to hang out while we go through a few of our uh, contributors' uh, contributions. Well, I, I have another commitment, but I, I have a lot of confidence in your ability to charge on without me, Judy. So uh, I'll leave it in your capable hands. And Roxy, thank you for the help. And all that are on the call, thank you for joining us. Have a good day. Bye. Absolutely. All right. Thanks so much, Doug. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Okay. Well, that is such a pure message for all of us, and it is so easy if we take the time, if we uh, have the intention, if we make the commitment. And uh, you know, I, I, I just think it's something we can all do in various ways. We don't necessarily have to pen 20 notes a day, but going to the people that we interact with and letting them know how we feel about them and what the difference that they make is uh, uh, equally inspiring. So today, um, I would like to go through some of our all of our contributions kind of quickly because we um, we, we had a, a rich and uh, wonderful session today with Doug. But I'll just show you a little bit of this podcast. That uh, you all know that James Trella uh, founded this Art of Grateful Leadership podcast series. Uh, it was uh, three years ago, over three years ago now. And uh, you'll just hear a little bit about that. Roxy, why don't you uh, play the, uh, the clip you, we pulled out of this one. A great a Grateful Leadership On Demand course mm -hmm. and submitted a response to me to one of the questions that knocked my socks off. And since that was the name of the exercise, this was a real and exciting happening. My reaching back to him to discuss his response led to Jim's proposing to create a weekly podcast about the Grateful Leadership Initiative, which he did every single week for three years. Jim, I really want to welcome you in this role reversing interview and what a pleasure it is to have you here. Judy, it's great to be here. Uh, it is very interesting being on, I'd say, this side of the microphone for a change. <laughs> Well, I still wish it were the other way around, but, uh, you know, you've created something worth continuing. So that's well, been uh, my my mission here. And uh, I'd love to invite you to tell us the story of the acknowledgement you wrote to uh, your first boss in, in response to our exercise. That, that was so out of the box, and I'd never seen a response like that before. Those thousands of people have taken the course, and I've never seen one like it since. Well, it, it goes back to when I worked my way through college. I was working for a small manufacturing company, and I had a boss that really brought me into a lot of, lot of conversations when it came to setting up the computer system, when it came to 
helping solve problems out on the manufacturing floor using the computer, how to become more efficient, and a number of different things. And over the four years or so that I worked at the company, we put together some real interesting solutions, doing nothing, using nothing more than what was at that time, just, uh, just a PC, you know, that sat on somebody's desk, but we figured out how to use it and work through that. Then as I finished up my degree, um, it was, he kind of watched me. And when I was ready to settling in after finishing my degree, I said, okay, I'm going to come here. I'm going to, I'll continue working here. And I was really getting comfortable at this small manufacturing company, but they didn't have an IT department, nor did they have an IT budget. It was just a small company. So one day he brought me into his office and he said, Jim, I have to let you go. I have to, you know, get all of your stuff. We're, we're going to the door. It's time for you to, it's time for you to, um, it's time for you to, to move on. Uh, we, and he explained the whole thing about, we don't have any, or we don't have a, an inf- information systems budget. We don't have this and you're getting settled in here. And I think you can do better things somewhere else. And as he walked me to the door, he said, Jim, one day you will thank me for this. Wow. And so I walked to the door and couldn't go back, obviously. So here it was 30 years later that I was <laughs> sitting and listening to your, uh, it was the Grateful Leadership on Demand course. Yes. Up came the knock your socks off for, uh, exercise. And I said, you know, and he to mind. So I wrote an email to him explaining essentially what I just went through with you, Judy, about how much I appreciated what he did in bringing me in and treating me as a peer, listening to my ideas, using me to help really bring the computer system into a small manufacturing company and all of the other ideas that we would toss around and try to work through. I said, it was great. And I said, I remember the day you walked me to the door and you said, one day you'll thank me for this. Mm-hmm. Well, it was Rod. I said, Rod, you're right. I am grateful for all that you did for me in this position because it set me up for where I eventually got to in my life. So that was uh, an amazing story, and and, uh, Jim also talked about some other important things on that podcast. I hope you all take the time and uh, have the interest in listening to it. He he talks about the use of grateful leadership in project management when we have to influence without authority, and that's a real dilemma for a lot of project managers, but I couldn't agree with him more about that topic. And then bringing grateful leadership into your organization, why resistance happens and what to do about it. Uh, Jim was quite fearless. He he walked up to the office of the CEO of General Motors, Mary Barra, and he left a copy of the grateful leadership book on her desk. (laughs) Well, he got it to the person just outside her office, I think, who put it on her desk. And she she, uh, wrote a very nice email to him and talked about what they were doing along those lines and what they wanted to do. And Jim is still plugging away at that. So never lose hope if it's something you see as having a place in your organization. So um, the podcasts are now on a every other week basis. I guess maybe I don't have quite the same stamina that Jim had, <laughs> but um, it, it, it's a, a wonderful opportunity to bring you in as my guest, and we've had a fair number of you already, and some people I'm still trying to convince. Uh, I've had Susan Parente here, she's an amazing uh, enthusiast, and uh, she's also certified as a, 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 cert- a Grateful Leadership Certified Professional, professional Level 1, and um, Jonathan McCoy was, uh, I think he was the first guest I had on this new series that I took over, and um, yeah, I'd love to have anyone who has an interest in a dialogue with a message. What is your message as it relates to grateful leadership and the power of acknowledgement? 
Joe, I want to say, I'm still trying to convince Harry Waldron, not to put you on the spot or anything, Harry, but he's one of our great supporters. And he does a monthly acrostic. And uh, it's always got a theme that ties in with what's going on in the world. And with people going back to school, children going back to school, adults going back to school in September, with continuing education, he talks about continuing gratitude education. And what we uh, really can enjoy about Harry's uh, acrostics is that they are so um, simple. Wait, let me just see. You see, continuing. And then, Roxy, if you would just move the next one. Um, continuing gratitude education. Yeah. So, um, I mean, and each letter has a wonderful point. And the column is called Get the Right Attitude through gratitude. So Harry, thank you for continuing to do that. I think you're on about your third year of that, and maybe longer. And we, we welcome it. We hope you'll keep on doing it forever. Then uh, Don Officer uh, does a monthly uh, column called The Gratitude Connection. And he connects grateful leadership to an amazing number of other books and thought leaders, and, and I, I never know what's going to be until I get the article uh, a little bit before the webinar. But it's always a surprise, and he's always amazing. He connected um, grateful leadership to uh, the work of Viktor Frankl, which some of you may know about. Man's Search for Meaning, Meaning was one of the most all-time most popular books that there are in the world. and. Um, he, he, Don connects it in such a beautiful way because uh, some of you may know that Viktor Frankl was in a concentration camp during the war for uh, a year uh, or over a year. And uh, Don writes, disciplined self-leadership made possible by deep gratitude for his nearly invulnerable sense of purpose kept him alive when so many others either surrendered to the despair of self-abandonment or found ways to nourish a reckless soul devouring grievance. So um, he connects it to gratitude in a very powerful way. And I uh, invite you all to read that article. And uh, then we have a wonderful contribution by Roxy Nevin, our very own. And um, her 10 tips on raising grateful kids I mean, I, I, want, <laughs> I want my children to learn these 10 tips for raising my grandchildren. I haven't quite convinced them yet to do that, but I, I'm going to work on it. Roxy, you want to say a few words about this? Sure, absolutely. Um, I hadn't done an article like this before in this series, so I just wanted to <clears throat> kind of do one that gave everybody some, some helpful tips. Um, Cicero is you know, one of my absolute favorite uh, writers. And, he wrote, gratitude is not only the greatest of the virtues, but the parent of all the others. And I agree with that so much because that you can't really, um, you can't do anything without having the gratitude first. Gratitude comes, you know, being thankful for everything that uh, you are presented with comes before everything else. And, you know, as parents, we wonder if we're making right choices with our kids and we question ourselves. and. Because there's no guidebook out there uh, to tell us, I, you know, I just think that articles like this are fantastic to um, give everybody kind of a standing point for, um, you know, things that they can do <clears throat> to be helpful to their um, kids. And so, if you want to read the article, just go to gratefulleadership.com under uh, member articles. You'll find the Grateful Parenting, and you can read this article um, and go through some of these tips for raising grateful kids. Bravo, Roxy. I think you did a magnificent job with this article. And uh, I really think we should do something further with it, as I said. So uh, next month, on September 10th, we will be having Elizabeth Frederick, who was here a little while ago. Unfortunately, I, I uh, assume she had to leave. But she uh, won't be leaving next 
month when she comes. She's the operation officer of Criteria for Success, and um, she has done a uh, session on our Leadership and Innovation Conference that's really excellent, nurturing an innovative team. And she also wrote an ebook on being a grateful leader, so she really identifies with this model of leadership, and uh, we're delighted to be having her next month. So I hope you'll all be here and bring your colleagues, your, uh, you know, your family members, <laughs> any, anybody who matters to you. This is a way they can get recharged, rejuvenated, and re-inspired. So Roxy is uh, asking how you heard about uh, today's event, and we would just uh, appreciate it if you don't, those of you who are still here, if you would just take a minute to uh, fill it out. It helps us to know, because we're very interested in getting the word out to many, many people, so we can all be inspired. But the speakers that we have are excellent. I, I think they've been uniformly outstanding. And, uh, you know, we're uh, fearless in who we reach out to, so if you tell us we should have uh, a world leader on or somebody <laughs> We won't hesitate to invite them as a, as a guest speaker as long as they will resonate with our initiative. And just to let everyone know, I've placed a link in the text chat. Uh, if you click that link, it will take you to the registration page for the Leadership and Online Conference with an automatic $10 discount. Yes, and the access period for that conference is through the end of this year. So we, we gave it a lot more access than we normally do because of the unusual times we're living through. So any closing comments, uh, feedback, suggestions for future webinars, we'd love to hear from you. And um, please feel free to use your microphone if you have a, a suggestion or text, either way. Ah, oh, Harry has a great tip. He likes hiring the second Thursday of each month to reserve the meeting time from 1 to 2, well in advance. That's awesome, Harry. And we should all do that. I mean, I, ha I do it um, kind of automatically also, but I don't know if the others of you are giving yourself those uh, you know, if you just assume that you'll be at all of them and uh, tell people you're, uh, you can't attend their meetings when uh, we're having a webinar. I love that idea. Thank and you. And just a reminder that if you have not already done so, you can sign up for the Center for Grateful Leadership at our website, www.gratefulleadership.com, and then you will receive email notifications and invites to all of our webinars. And you can also follow us on social media. Thanks, Roxy. And uh, get access to that as well, as well, as well as notifications to our podcast, which can be found on Apple Podcasts, as well as Stitcher. Great. Jonathan said he could not uh, submit a response through the survey, but... Okay, thanks, uh, you got an invite from me and the IRL email. Okay, great. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, that's helpful to us just to get a sense. Uh, <laughs> Susan Frente says it's the best deal in town. Worth $1,000, but it's free to be a CGL. No, oh, million dollars. Wow. That's wonderful. I left off a few zeros, didn't I? Thank you, Susan. That's beautiful. Okay. Well, we're officially uh, concluding this webinar. Stay tuned for next month, and uh, we'll stay on and chat with anybody who wants to remain. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Oh, you know what, Barbara, you had an interesting point about uh, small business. You want to just say something about that? Uh, 
can you say anything now? Or maybe we can find your comment. If you stick around, we can give it, uh, just remember it. So, Barbara was saying that um, she worked in um, a medical office and doctors and nurses were not given appreciation. They were not shown appreciation. I can't find the exact chat, but um, Barbara, is there anything more you want to say about that? I agree, and I, I mentioned to her that my latest podcast deals with that issue. It focuses on frontline workers, but uh, it's true in all medical offices, I believe. Okay, I've scrolled up to her comment, and, Judy, but uh, it says, I've worked in small businesses, uh, particularly dentistry, and I've rarely felt doctors recognized or showed appreciation. I feel that same. Very good. I mean, yeah. No, that, I'm glad you found it. I think that's important, and uh, that should change. And hopefully, people who are working in those offices can do something about it. Thanks for making the comment, Barbara. 